So today I want to share with you this idea of Peter Pan syndrome and what it actually means and the deeper levels of meaning behind Peter P Pan syndrome as it relates to the dismissive avoidant attachment style. Now I will do a series on all the different attachment styles around this and we'll really break this down into some deep stuff that will hopefully help you deeply understand this a lot more. But if you haven't already been familiarized with attachment styles, um, we basically have four main attachment styles or love styles. One of the four is the dismissive avoidant. And as a general rule, dismissive avoidance actually do tend to struggle with Peter Pan syndrome the most. And if you're not familiar with Peter Pan syndrome, it's sort of this idea where like the body grows up, but the mind does not. And in psychological terms, this is actually called arrested development. So in this video, I'm going to take you through what that really is, why it happens, and some really powerful steps to not just understand it, but to actually be able to break through this at a high level. So dismissive avoidance as the love style or attachment style, they tend to be the ones who are most commitment fearing as a general rule, um, most pervasively commitment fearing at least. And they tend to be the types of individuals who actually struggle to really open up and deeply emotionally bond and connect. And they also tend to struggle with things like vulnerability and um, you know, taking emotional components of life more seriously. Now, when we hear the term arrested development, and that's actually the psychological term for Peter Pan syndrome, there's this idea where it's like the body grows up, but the mind does not, as if we have like a child stuck in an adult's body. But it's much more nuanced than that. It's not like the body grows up and the mind stays, you know, frozen in time at five years old. It's that we tend to have very specific aspects of the self that struggle to evolve. So I really want to show you why this is first, so then you can understand what's going on. So watch this for a second. Wherever we are growing, or sorry, wherever we are um, self-protecting, we are not growing. Because wherever we are in self-preservation mode, we cannot possibly be in self-protection mode or self-preservation mode and evolving at the same time. And here's why. Four of the main components of what actually leads to growth is number one, in order to grow through anything, we have to be able to first self-observe. And in that self-observation, we have to recognize that there is some sort of problem or obstacle that we have to grow through. We then have to take accountability and find a strategy for breaking through that problem or obstacle. And then we have to rinse and repeat that strategy using repetition and emotion, you know, of a new behavior or a new output until that gets wired in. So let's just use the example of somebody struggling with anger. If somebody really struggles with, actually, let's use it on topic for, for this video. Let's say somebody struggles to, to commit. They're really afraid of emotional and serious commitments in romantic relationships. Well, in order to grow through that, first of all, you have to be able to become self-aware around that. Like even just notice that, hey, that's a pattern for me. It's not just this relationship or this circumstance, but actually that's a longstanding pattern. And I almost always struggle to commit around the four to five month mark. And I start pulling away and I start shutting down and wow, I'm noticing that. So we have to be able to do that step first. Second of all, then we have to be able to go, okay, you know, what's the underlying pattern here? Like, where is this coming from? What are the roots? And then we have to be able to take accountability and responsibility for doing something differently, right? So we might have to say, you know what, the root is that, um, you know, when I start having to feel really vulnerable, it scares me and I'm scared that I won't be able to work through conflict. So I'll commit to something and then we'll have problems and then I'll be trapped in an unhealthy situation. And so I'm trying to avoid that outcome. And okay, that means I'm struggling with conflict and I have to learn to communicate better. And that also means I have to learn to be able to practice vulnerability and then I can grow and change. So we have those sort of four steps, right? Then I can practice being vulnerable on a daily basis. I can practice communicating through conflict until I become good at it and masterful around it. And then I've, I've actually been able to grow through an experience. Now, when we are in self-protection mode, we don't have the reach to even start with a self-observation piece. So that very first step that pertains to growth, we don't even have in our awareness because when we are protecting, we are focused on the external world that we're protecting ourselves from rather than doing a deep dive into being the witness of our own internal world and experience. And so we tend to do things more like blame, you know, protect from things in the external world that we're projecting onto our external world. And we tend to get stuck in the mindset of things 
things like, oh, it's the person that's causing me to not want to commit or the situation rather than something within me that's experiencing this sort of co-creation of events that, hey, I have to also take personal accountability for my end of things. So I want to be really clear here. We can't be in self-preservation mode or self-protection mode and growth mode at the same time. We can't even really get through step one of growth mode. So then we have to look at underneath that. Why does this happen? Well, arrested development is like a part of us is frozen in time. And essentially why this happens is because when we go through a traumatic event, we go into self-protection mode. So let's just say as, as an example that as um, we'll use a, a general example, then we'll go into like a specific to the dismissive avoidant example. But as a general rule, let's say if somebody struggles with anger and maybe they learn to become angry as a, a way of protecting themselves from a scary environment where there was a lot of anger. And maybe they learned, okay, if I express anger and I get big and loud, I can defend myself better and then I can kind of feel safer. And while that might serve while you're in this really chaotic environment, when you grow up, that same coping mechanism you used that's been so wired in there because you had to use it so many times, that same coping mechanism now becomes something that sabotages your relationships or that pushes people away or that doesn't allow you to properly be vulnerable and share what's going on for you. And instead, when you express through anger, it's like people get so busy defending themselves against your anger, they don't really hear and see you. And so the things that we tend to form as coping mechanisms, they kind of act like little shells around our, our experience and they prevent us from growing. And so the time at which we develop that coping mechanism. So let's say you learned to get really angry when you were 10 years old, 12 years old, and maybe you had a really chaotic environment, you know, growing up with, with a lot of chaos in the home, maybe parents struggling with drugs or alcohol issues, and you had to get angry and sort of defend yourself at a young age. Well, the, the time at which you acquired that coping mechanism because then you form the shell of going immediately and directly into that coping mechanism. As soon as you felt that you were threatened or something wasn't going right or something felt scary and, and you go immediately into overexpressing anger and being really, you know, on the, the defensive. Um, well, when you emotionally acquired that coping mechanism at 10 years old, you never got the opportunity to self-observe, like we talked about what's necessary for growth and find the root cause and break through that. So you lost your wisdom or the development or evolution of wisdom um, to break through that experience at 10 years old. So now every time you have like a perceived threat, you go right into anger and you don't actually learn how to deal with that perceived threat through things like setting healthy boundaries, having an honest conversation. So the part of you that's still using that coping mechanism has the emotional awareness of a 10 year old because you never grew past that. So anything that would trigger you to be angry, you not only don't learn the lessons around and don't evolve through, but there's also tremendous downsides. Like these things can sabotage your relationship. So think of this dynamic as being wherever we have arrested development, and there can be multiple places in our lives, we have the wisdom of who we were when we developed the arrested development coping mechanism. So now let's plug this into like the Peter Pan thing, okay? So Peter Pan syndrome, right? It's the same thing. It's just the, the more slang sort of version of this. But what do we see for the dismissive avoidant version? Well, we see that dismissive avoidance as a general rule, they really fear commitment at a very young age when their needs are not met and when they don't have the ability to get emotionally connected to their caregivers because their caregivers are not emotionally available, what happens is they shut that part of themselves down. The part of them that learns to express their emotions, learns to tune into their needs and their feelings and their opinions, and learns to feel safe being vulnerable and bonding more deeply with others and opening up all that's repressed. The time at which that got repressed, it's like that aspect of the self is frozen in time at that age. So when you ask a dismissive avoidant to be vulnerable, to open up, to do all these things, they might have the wisdom in that place of a seven-year-old, of a five-year-old, of a 12-year-old, like depending on how much development actually happened. And so what essentially happens is we get frozen in time in the places that we didn't get the capacity to learn the coping mechanisms we needed in order to evolve.
And we all have versions of this. So what do we do about this? And I hope this makes sense. I might even do like a part two video. I'm just going to share actually with you in this video, some, some symptoms. So when you're struggling with arrested development and you see this with dismissive avoidance, right? They have Peter Pan syndrome sometimes around, um, and I'm using Peter Pan syndrome and arrested development in, in an interchangeable way, but they sometimes have this around commitment, um, opening up, being vulnerable, letting people in, um, you know, sharing their needs, being able to work through conflict. And instead they have these childlike coping mechanisms sometimes. And I don't say this from a place of judgment at all. It's not a judgment. It's a representation of a tra traumatic event that took place where we just formed this automatic coping mechanism around. And because we're coping, we can't be growing. And so, you know, you'll often see when people are going through arrested development, they feel childlike. They have behavioral coping mechanisms that are childlike. They might struggle with impulse control. They might have magnified fight, flight, freeze, or fawn reactions. They might have a lot of fear. Um, you might see that people become more selfish and self-oriented when they've got this arrested development sort of space. And you can actually think of young children like you know think of dismissive avoidant children what do we know they tend to minimize their attachment needs from a caregiver by looking away so this is a really long topic i'm going to go on and give you like a couple tips for what you can do and probably put like a part two of this video as well but um if you want to check out if this is something you're like oh my gosh this relates to me especially if you see yourself frozen or struggling with some form of arrested development because it can really show, show up in any area of our lives it can show up in our family relationships our friendships it can show up in our social lives it can show up with work and career oriented things if you see any of that i have a full webinar that will help you understand the root causes and break through this and it's only an hour and a half long and it will literally get you the breakthroughs you're needing within that hour and a half. And it's in PDS. It's called Arrested Development. Um, and you can just go right into the webinar library and check it out. And you can check it out for free for seven days, which again, will give you more than enough time to get through the actual webinar itself and get that breakthrough and those sort of aha moments you need to, to move the needle on this experience. Um, but you can use the link down below if you want to check it out. And it's just in the webinar library at PDS when you just search Arrested Development in the search bar. So um, what can you do about this? Well, you know, the first thing is to recognize that this is happening, right? Because in recognizing that we have these arrested development parts of self, these are the parts of the self that are essentially frozen in time. And it's not like they're actually frozen in time, right? But, but from an analogy perspective, that part of us didn't get to grow. We were too busy forming a shell that we couldn't let any like nurturing in so that we could evolve. And so what we actually have to do in the places that we're struggling with these things is we have to look at how we can nurture ourselves through these experiences. If we didn't get needs met growing up in our childhood, we have to learn to give those needs to ourselves and then go out into the world and request those needs from other people once we know what it's like to get into relationship to self. So a lot of, um, for dismissive avoidance, like so much of the root cause of this arrested development or Peter Pan syndrome is that they still are frozen in this space where they haven't had the capacity to learn to emotionally connect to themselves, learn what their own feelings are, learn what wisdom their feelings are trying to tell them. Feelings are only feedback mechanisms and they help us actually grow and expand and understand things differently. Like feelings are feedback and they really help us. But when we're not in that space, and we can't receive our own inner wisdom or guidance because we've shut off and disconnected from that part of the self, aka like the emotional self, then it's really difficult for us to evolve. So a huge component of this for the Peter Pan syndrome or arrested development, dismissive avoidance when they're struggling with this tends to be they have to learn to get in touch with their emotions, self-observe, get back into understanding what their feelings are telling them. Like, oh, my feelings are always telling me that something's not right. Something's out of alignment if I don't feel good. What is that? Is it a need? Is it the way I'm speaking to myself and in my internal dialogue? How can I then be kinder to myself? And in doing that and making our own feelings okay, we make sharing and expressing and connecting emotionally with others okay. And then commitment doesn't feel so scary. And that's one big part of healing arrested development as a dismissive avoidant. Another part in the concept of Peter Pan syndrome and like commitment fears is also um, being able to master communicating through conflict. Like a lot of dismissive avoidance, they'll flaw find and they will 
um, like really trying to find the perfect partner because it's a subconscious strategy to avoid conflict. But underneath that, there's some really powerful, you know, once I learn to work through conflict, I'll realize that it's okay to not have the perfect partner. Partners are not going to be perfect. And I don't have to use this idea of perfectionism as a strategy for self-protection. And when I learn to just talk through things and communicate my needs and share my feelings with my partner and share what's going wrong for me or what I don't like or do like, and they can do that too. And we can support each other in that. Then I don't need to use this idea of a perfect partner as a way of avoiding conflict and avoiding those conversations that are actually a necessary part of having healthy and securely attached relationships. So this is a big topic. Again, if you're like, oh my gosh, this is interesting. Go check out the webinar. You can go in. It's an hour and a half. You can sit through it. You've got seven days to go through it and you can check it out for free during that seven days. Um, and it will really help you understand arrested development actually of all the different attachment styles and how it works and really does a much deeper dive that will save you a lot of time researching it and understanding like how to break through these patterns wherever they might be happening for you in your life. So I hope this makes sense. Um, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Um, if you enjoyed this, please consider subscribing to this channel. I put daily videos out here every single day about attachment styles, the subconscious mind, healing, growth, um, personal development as a whole. So I hope you enjoy and looking forward to seeing you in future videos.